project. So in, in terms of framing this session, when we think about the interrelationship of gender and violent extremism, a number of concerns come to the fore. Almost all of them are under-researched. Most of them are under-conceptualized, and some of them seriously so. First would be the increased targeting of women and girls, recognizing an underutilized resource by violent extremist organizations, and expanding the range of roles that are offered to them, moving from a focus on the domestic sphere and satisfying the needs of men and raising the next generation of jihadi fighters, to a range of more active roles that include supply logistics, intelligence, translation, propaganda, recruitment, all through the continuum to suicide bombers. ISIS got quite desperate in 2017 and issued a diktat beginning to look for women for combat roles. So what are the appeals these organizations are making to women? And which appeals are being targeted to which groups of women and girls? What are the most successful channels of influence? What factors then influence women and girls to join or to support a violent extremist organization? And how do those factors rack and stack against the factors that drive men and boys? We think that some of the factors are very similar. For example, the search for belonging identity, adventure, a cause, and certainly the search for a greater sense of agency may be very similar. But are there differences as well? For example, what's the role of gender inequality and gender-based violence as possible push factors for females? We don't actually have the evidence at this point to say that gender inequality is correlated with violent extremism, we do know that it is correlated significantly with violent conflict. So um, another question that comes to the fore with the presumed demise of ISIS in Syria and Iraq is how women exit violent extremist organizations. We know that women seeking to get out of skinhead and neo-Nazi extremist organizations do so when they're fed up at how badly they're being treated. But how do women in a religious VEO exit? Are the pathways similar to the pathways for men? Men often leave when they get fed up with the gap between the leader's talk and their actual walk. Is it the same for women? How does women's experience differ from the appeals made by VEOs once they're in the organization? Men by ISIS were promised five-star jihad. They didn't quite get that. And what about women? They presumably didn't uh, find that the promises that they were made got met. So what are the pathways out? What kind of support do women need to get out? Um, are the pathways similar to those of men? There's one hypothesis that women find it harder to leave because they're more reliant on family support than is the case for men. Then I think a really interesting question that's certainly under-researched and is really startling when you think about ISIS as a shining example of this is extremist organizations' use of heightened masculinity and male privilege, including power over women, to recruit men and boys. How much of a lure was this? How does it stack up against other factors that influence joining a VEO? I mean, one suspects also that it's not just male privilege that is important here, but male resentment of the gains that women made and problems with additionally competitive marketplaces for labor with youth bulges that mean youth unemployment is, is really high, um, and with pressure on men as breadwinners, that being the sine qua known as masculinity or of masculinity in many of these cultures. So what role do resentments play around women's gains? 
The other interesting question with this heightened sense of masculinity that is propagated is maybe this isn't just attractive to young men. Maybe it's attractive to young females as well. So if you think about the really slick ISIS videos of young men in the back of a technical, those are those pickup trucks with the big guns in it. So these are young guys holding guns, riding around, hair flying in the wind. You can envision some set of teenage girls swooning over this potentially. So what role does that play? And then finally, as Chris Fair or me as her substitute will discuss later, women are also using these norms of masculinity to either shame their men into taking part or to egging them on. Now for those of us in the development space, we know very little about the effects and the effectiveness of engaging women in P and CBE programming. There's a lively debate now, which Leslie will get into, on engaging women as mothers and asking them to recognize and act on risk in their families. This is Vice, another set of people who say that in doing this, you are instrumentalizing women. You are putting the burden of solving the radicalization problem on their shoulders in very conservative societies, potentially, and making them responsible for what the men folk in their families do. Of equal interest is engaging women in promoting social cohesion, community resilience, tolerance, and engaging them at higher levels with government on CBE policies and uh, security policies and the implementation of, of those policies. Finally, what do we do about uh, these hyper notions of masculinity? How do PCBE programs respond to those? There's quite a lot of work on this in the everyday world of domestic violence, how much of that is importable to this space or is usable. Then I think it's critically important to start tracking the impact of VEO behavior and norms around gender on the gains that women and girls have made in recent decades and on gender-based violence. I mean, one can envision the risks here uh, lower child vaccination rates, increased female fertility, decreased ability to be in public space, decreased political participation, decreased labor force participation. It's not only VEOs that contribute to this, of course, but the globalization of more literalist forms of Islam, Buddhism, and so on, Hinduism, it's not limited to the Islamic world are also influencing these trends. Um, so I think gender empowerment programs remain critically important in these societies in order to push back on this trend. So the great news for you is that we're not trying to answer all these questions in these 90 minutes, nor could we. The evidence base simply doesn't exist at this point, but we hope to shed a little bit of light on some of them. We will be talking about research approaches, some as, as well. Um, given the expertise of our speakers, we'll be focusing a little bit more on examples from Southeast Asia and South Asia. And with that, I will turn it over to Leslie Dwyer. Oh, and as soon as the two speakers are completed, I will open it up to you. I've tried to leave plenty of time for the audience to engage. Thank you so much, Lynn, and thank you all for being here today. Um, I'm personally really excited as the director of the Center for the Study of Gender and Conflict um, to see so many people really here, um, I'm assuming, for interest in, in violent extremist issues and their relation to peace building, um, but also for your interest in thinking about gender. And it's great to see at AFP each year there's more and more of us who are really trying to think of this as a core part of conflict dynamics, of the dynamics of violent extremism. Um, so as Lynn said, what I want to talk about is I want to talk more about um, some of the questions and also I want to point out some of the gaps, places where I think all of us have an opportunity to weigh in. And so I'm also very excited that we're going to have a lot of time for discussion today because I'm not going to stand here and try to spend 20 minutes um, telling you uh, the answers to all of the questions that Lynn is raising. So I think that we can also have some time for discussion of them. Um, as Lynn mentioned, I will, I'm an anthropologist and I've been working in Southeast Asia, primarily in Indonesia for the past 20 plus years. Um, but 
primarily on issues of, of violent conflict, post-conflict peace building. Um, but over the past couple of years, I've become more and more interested in conflicts that have emerged in that context um, around the around violent extremism and how we can address it. And so this is a report um, that was that was commissioned for USAID on the role of women in violent extremism extremism in Asia, including two case studies, one on Indonesia and one on Kyrgyzstan. And so I'm going to talk a bit um, about some of the, the research that emerged from this report. And of course, it's available for you if you would like to look at it in more detail. I'll mention here that it was done with a colleague of mine, Elizabeth Rhodes, who's at King's College in London. Um, so it was really a, a, a review of the existing literature on VE and CVE in, in Asia. Um, and I was talking to a colleague yesterday about how wonderful it is as an academic to really have time to sit down and really review sort of everything that's out there and to see both the exciting trends in the research and then also to look at some of the gaps. Um, so I do want to emphasize here, this report was limited by, by the fact that it was a desk study, although of course it was complemented by strong regional expertise on, on behalf of, of myself and my co-author. Um, but what we found by really looking at what is out there on gender and VE issues and CVE issues in Asia um, is that there's a lot of gaps in that literature. So the existing literature tends to be um, anecdotal, so it's, it's telling stories, maybe those are stories of um, atrocious events, uh, suicide bombings, attempted suicide bombings, attacks, and so on, um, and oftentimes sensationalist. So there's a lot of almost journalistic work that's done also by NGOs and INGOs that's sort of talking about um, these figures, like the woman of ISIS, um, the woman who is entrapped and manipulated into participating in things that maybe she doesn't understand. So there's a lot of caricatures um, and dominant narratives that are shaping our understanding, sometimes quite explicitly and also sometimes implicitly. So this is a, a problem in the literature and is, there's a lot of space um, for us to be doing more work here. A lot of the literature is country or project specific, um, and this makes sense, right? So folks who are doing particular projects who are trying to evaluate their outcomes um, or people who are working in particular country contexts, um, <coughs> but it's a problem in that one of the things that I'm gonna talk about in a minute is that one of the things that emerges from this research and looking at what other folks have done as well um, is that there's a lot of important regional dy dynamics that we're oftentimes missing. Um, these may have to do with migration. These may have to do, of course, with, with narratives and globalizing flows of internet messaging and propaganda and so on. But when we limit our focus to the country or to the particular project especially, we're missing a lot. Um, there's a lot of things that are happening regionally that we need to be looking at. Um, there's little discussion of these regional dynamics. There's lack, we're lacking in evaluative data. So as Lynn mentioned, really strong data to see what works and what doesn't work. And I will talk about this more in a minute um, in terms of efforts and framings to bring women into CVE efforts. Um, but we don't have good solid data as to whether it really works to position women as mothers trying to um, serve on the front lines as first responders to what their kids might be doing um, and the harm that that might put them in and so on and so forth. So we need more actual data about what works and what doesn't. Um, and there's also a real focus, and of course this is the case when we're talking about gender and conflict more broadly or gender and peace building more broadly, um, that when we're talking about gender, we're oftentimes simply talking about women, right? Um, adding women to existing prefigured programming, um, thinking about women simply as a demographic group, um, rather than thinking about how ideas about gender, how ideas about femininity and masculinity, what it means to be a woman, what it means to be a man, how those might be driving particular dynamics of conflict or violent extremism. Um, and so this is really a problem that, that I'm seeing, and there's a, also, of course, it opens a door for all of us who are doing research in this field to try to imagine other ways of, of, of understanding. Um, and of course, there's little explicit attention to issues of intersectionality. Um, so this might be about how gender intersects um, with religious identity, with racial identity. Um, it also might be how particular groups of people become more vulnerable because of their migrant status, because of their socioeconomic status. And there hasn't been a lot of attempt to really try to drill down data-wise as to how other forms of identity or positionality might also be impacting people's vulnerability, people's agency. Um, and of course, when we're talking about Asia, 
as we all know, it's, that's, a, that's a big sort of monolithic homogenous claim that we're making and there needs to be more attention to parts of Asia that we don't know as much about as others. And so the figure maybe of um, gender in Pakistan or even I think now gender in Indonesia oftentimes tends to obscure um, some of the regional dynamics, some of the local dynamics in other places we don't know as much about, right? There's not a whole lot of literature out there about gender in VE in Thailand, for instance. Um, and they're starting maybe to be a little bit more about Burma after the Rohingya crisis. Um, but we need to try to understand more about particular parts of Asia. Um, I will focus today mainly on, on Indonesia and also maybe say a little bit about Kyrgyzstan because that was the other case in the report. Okay, so thinking about the key factors, if we're looking at the literature on gender and, and VE in Asia, um, we're seeing that the push and pull factors that are driving VE recruitment in Asia more in general are, are quite highly gendered. And so Lynn mentioned something about different messaging being crafted for women, different messaging being crafted for men. Um, we're also seeing that women are playing increasingly important roles in violent extremist organizations. Um, anybody who was watching the news about Indonesia this past April, and you know, or even if you were just reading, it, it made the headlines, of course, all over the world, that there was a series of suicide bombings on three churches in, in the city of Surabaya, Indonesia's second largest city, um, in which women participated. Not only did women participate, um, but they also brought their children. So there was one case in which a woman um, had her nine-year-old daughter on a motorbike and had her daughter hold the bomb. Um, and so these shifts towards women as this, this um, secondary uh, group of people who maybe we didn't really need to be so concerned about, um, all kinds of stereotypes that we, we might bring to the issue, assuming that women are more peaceful than men or they're just being manipulated into participating. A lot of these stereotypes were shattered after those Surabaya bombings and there was a lot of debate um, both in Indonesia and globally about how to make sense of this. This of course isn't the only case that we have, there are many, many cases, um, but it really I think that that moment of the Surabaya bombings in April has signaled a shift for many of us working in this space um, towards trying to take more seriously women's participation in VEOs and really trying to understand what's going on there. Um, the other thing that we're seeing is when we're thinking about the push factors, the kinds of motivations that are pushing women to join VEOs, um, is that gender inequality, gender-based violence, and a lack of meaningful social opportunities, economic opportunities, are also pushing women um, to participate in violent extremism. As Lynn said, the promise that's offered by groups like ISIS may not actually um, be, be what happens when, when women actually do join, but there's oftentimes a sense, and this is explicitly reflected in propaganda directed at women, um, that if you're, if you're concerned as a woman about having a lack of opportunity, if you're concerned about levels of gender-based violence in your society, here you're being offered a space where you'll be not just protected, not just safe from violence, but you'll also have the opportunity to do meaningful work, to make a meaningful contribution socially. Um, so I think it's really important not to underemphasize the way that gender inequality is actually driving women's participation in VEOs. Um, as I said before, when I talked about a little bit about, about intersectionality, um, gender inequality also, of course, intersects with other forms of, of difference in inequality, including especially in the Asian context, migrant status. Um, so there's a lot of data, or, or not a lot, but there, there's a fair amount of data that's showing how migrant women workers within the Asia region have become more vulnerable to violent extremist organizations. Um, there's a, there's, um, there are one of these pathways from Indonesia is women who go to work in places like Hong Kong, other parts of, of East Asia, um, where they actually are targeted by violent extremist organizations um, to serve in, to participate in what's called money jihad. Um, so to contribute their wages to violent extremist organizations, and then maybe also to marry or to help to facilitate male extremists movements um, regionally and then also globally to sites of, 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 um, of conflict um, because they have some expertise, they have some stamps in their passport, maybe they have some English skills, they have some travel savvy, right? So they're also very helpful um, and, and have been targeted as such. So thinking about migration also, and of course these are women who are economically vulnerable to begin with, um, but thinking about how um, other forms of, of situatedness also make women 
uh, more vulnerable to violent extremism. Um, so these gendered recruitment narratives are also something that, that we're starting right now to, to understand. Um, and then also understanding the gender specific impacts of violent extremism. And this I think is a space um, that's really open for more research. So trying to understand when we're seeing a rise in violent extremism, when we're seeing a rise in women's participation, especially what impact does that have on other, on other women in the society? What impact does that have on gender norms? What in, impact does that have um, on, on gender narratives? And how does that open or constrict um, a space within that context? Um, some cautions, though, that I want to raise when we're thinking about this is that just as happens in the, in the, conflict, in the conflict and peace building field, work on violent extremism tends to neglect or to silo gender issues. Um, oftentimes, you know, and, and I think all of us are familiar with this phenomenon, right, when there's a gender person or there's a gender aspect of a peace building project, um, when we're thinking about violent extremism, it's, it's oftentimes siloed off into a separate project or it's siloed off into a separate um, set of, uh, of, of, of research um, attempts, right? So thinking about how we incorporate attention to gender more, more directly into our understanding of violent extremism is something that I would argue is really crucial. Um, this, I think, makes real sense if we're thinking about how dynamics of masculinity, dynamics of femininity, may also be part of what's driving violent extremism, may also be part of what's making it attractive for both, for both men and women. Um, so really trying to think about how we can bring more attention to gender to the fore of what we're doing. Um, stereotypes of women as lacking in agency, um, lacking in knowledge, really also do continue to dominate the literature. And this, of course, has real implications for programming if we're assuming that women who join violent, extremism, violent extremist organizations um, are doing so because they have been simply manipulated or duped by men, right, or duped by um, some, some evil propagandizing organization. That's going to look very, our, our interventions, our engagements are going to look very different than if we recognize the complex decision making that women are doing, the ways in which um, VE has become appealing to many women because of a sense that it offers an alternative to gender inequality and gender-based violence. But still this myth or this, this kind of dominant narrative of the, of the duped and manipulated disempowered woman still tends to um, shape a lot of our understandings of violent extremism. Um, I mentioned this earlier, but another caution is that we really need more robust framings of gender. We need this also in the conflict field and the peace building fields, right? But trying to really understand what do we mean when we're talking about gender and how we're also talking about frames of meaning. We're also talking about narratives. We're talking about cultural notions of what it means to be a man, what it means to be a woman, and how those might link up to violent extremism. So in other words, in a particular context, if being the breadwinner for the family is a crucial element of, of, of what masculinity means, or if we're in a situation of hypermasculinity where being a man means being able to wield weapons, um, being able to act in a way um, that, that aligns with, with VEO goals, um, then we also need to try to consider what, how, how gender isn't just men or just women. Um, we need to have more robust analytic frameworks to understand these context-specific dynamics. Um, and overall, Right, our attention to the Asia region has been much less than our attention to the Middle East and North Africa. So really trying to think about what local contexts, economic contexts, political contexts, cultural contexts, um, how those might actually um, be, playing a, be playing a role so that we're not simply just exporting models from one context to another in this one size fits all kind of way. Um, and then also really to try to understand, and this is something that, that if you look deeply at the literature on the region, um, it really is, is quite, um, um, astounding how often people seem to be struggling between identifying signs of increase of women's religiosity or increasing religiosity on the part of women um, and sort of signs warning signs of, of, of violent extremism in societies and um, this image here is actually uh, it's an image from the New York Times but um, this was a ban on face veils in at Indonesian University lasted just a week so it was a particular university in Indonesia, it was an Islamic university that actually banned the full face veil. Um, of course, arguing that this was a sign of 
terrorism or it was a sign of extremism, it was problematic. Um, but the failure to distinguish between, and, or to ask really why it is that, that women um, were, were taking on this particular form of dress, taking on this particular form of religious identity, um, sparked a real backlash not just by the uh, conservative um, Islamic groups in Indonesia, but also by others concerned about freedom of expression and human rights. And so this ban actually lasted a little over a week, but it really left a bad taste in many people's mouths and a real attempt to sort of try to grapple um, with how we may be mistaking, um, you know, playing into these, these dominant and problematic narratives that associate religiosity with terrorism. Um, and so trying to think about this is also a, an, another caution um, that emerges out of looking at what's going on in Asia. Okay, so thinking about women and countering violent extremism, um, Lynn, Lynn mentioned this as well too. So there's a, a, a framing that's become quite predominant um, that, that women have something very particular very special to contribute to CVE efforts. Um, oftentimes, there's simply an assumption that women are somehow more peaceful than men or um, a, a lack of understanding of the dynamics that actually drive women to support violent extremist organizations. Or often there's, I think, a more, um, a more realistic and, and moderate um, narrative, which is that women's social positions as, as mothers, as, as located within particular communities, that might give them a particular insight into an emerging VE risk. Um, and so women have been positioned through programs like mothers, schools, or other kinds of programs um, to provide early warning or first response to signs of violent extremism in communities and then also in, within their families. Um, so some of these programs might do things like train women, um, give them training in media literacy to help them try to understand what it is that the content that their kids are accessing online, um, to try to help them sort of navigate and make sense of some of the things that, that their kids might be doing, um, some of the, the content they might be accessing and some of the places and people who they might be meeting and to try to understand um, what to then do about that, to put them in networks that would help them to, to serve as, as first response. Um, and so this has become more and more popular and prevalent as a particular way of, of grappling with, with violent extremism. Um, there's also a, an opportunity framing here um, that, that focuses on the security sector and the importance of empowering women and allowing them to participate more fully in the security sector and that women's presence there establishes trust. And so when we're thinking about how to work against violent extremism, one of the ways in which we might be able to do that is thinking about how VEOs, grievances against a security sector, how those might be, might be moderated and mitigated, how we might be able to bridge um, and, and to improve relationships between the security sector and civil society, and that women's presence there can help to do that. Um, and then there's another opportunity framing that women can play key roles in resilience programs. So trying to think about how to encourage communities to become resilient to the lure of violent extremism um, through, role, through their participation in, in educational programs and religious training and community development. So this is the opportunity framing, right, that says that Traditionally, when we've been thinking about CVE efforts, it may have been a top-down, um, security-focused approach, but bringing women into this picture allows us to do more. It allows us to focus on prevention. It allows us to focus on, on community resilience. The challenge here, of course, um, <clears throat> and I have here a, a kind of, I think, uh, dominant narrative sort of image of, of what that might look like, right? So it's the little girl putting flowers in, in the gun. Um, but this, of course, raises real do-no-harm concerns, right, in, in the real world. If I walk up to somebody with my flowers and put them in the gun, it, you, you know, it's not, it doesn't always work so well. Um, but I want to highlight, what I want to highlight here is that we really do need to be thinking about the flip side of this, right, um, which is the possibility of putting women in harm's way by expecting them to 
either collaborate with or to legitimize security actors who might have poor track records on women's rights to compensate for weaknesses in governance or in the security sector, um, to think of, of putting women on the front lines without always making a concerted effort to evaluate not only whether this is working or not in terms of our programmatic goals, in terms of mitigating violent extremism, but what this is doing to women themselves, is it, all, is it empowering for them or is it putting them at greater risk? Um, and many folks who I've talked to, not just in the US, but in places like Indonesia and other places in Asia, warn very, very um, stridently about the danger of instrumentalizing women or securitizing women. Um, and so thinking about not just encouraging women's participation, but also about how to do that in a way that's safe and that also is empowering on women's own terms. The other challenge here is that attention to women's participation in CVE has oftentimes been limited to the local, so thinking about women's roles within families or within communities, but not thinking so much about how to bring their insights and experiences into national level and regional level policy. Um, and again, there's a real parallel, of course, with the, with the conflict and peace building field um, where you know the numbers of women who are part of high level negotiations is, is quite minimal and a lot of attention is, devel is, is devoted towards women's participation at the grassroots level. I'm not arguing that that's not important, um, but how to then also scale that up and to, if we're taking women seriously, um, their insights also incorporating them into our, into our policy making. Um, and again, just to reiterate that few programs engage in comprehensive gender analysis, comprehensive do no harm analysis, um, which makes it really a challenge to try to understand not only the benefits, but the possible risks of our programming. So some key takeaways here. First of all, local context matters, right? And this is where analysis comes in, and this is where I think there's a lot of room for a lot more research in this field, is that we really need to understand how this is playing out at, in particular contexts with particular groups of people. We need to pay attention to intersectionality. We need to pay attention to both local and regional dynamics. And we need to do this because we need to not be operating simply under just simply driven by our kind of time time warm worn assumptions about women as natural peace builders um, that are maybe driving our our efforts in mistaken directions and putting women at harm. We don't want to continue with the one size fits all programming. So more analysis is of course crucial. Regional context always matter also matters. So again, um, to get past the frame of the project or the frame of the country level analysis to really understand cross border dynamics of migration including labor migration, um, online networks, refugee flows, um, and just to point out here that in both Indonesia and Kyrgyzstan that migrant women um, have been specific tar specifically targeted um, by, by VEOs. Some other key takeaways, and, and Lynn mentioned this as well, um, that we know from the literature, we know from talking to people that it is these conflict-affected and fragile environments where we are dealing with inequality, corruption, repression, poor governance, um, that just as those are correlated with conflict prevalence, these also provide the enabling conditions for violent extremism to flourish. And so if we really want to address this, we can't give up on also trying to address the push factors, on trying to address gender inequality, on trying to address gender-based violence, um, and recognizing the way in which groups like ISIS are doing it, have done an excellent job of exploiting this in terms of their propaganda and narratives to promise the sisterhood free of GBV, free of, of corruption, um, full of opportunities for women. Um, and so thinking about CVE efforts is not simply siloed um, as well, not simply separate from broader development op efforts, from broader efforts at peace building, um, and trying to really in integrate and collaborate um, with other forms of, of gender equality work. And then a last key takeaway that I want to highlight is I think that there's a lot of room for folks who are working on VE and gender issues to learn from folks who are working on gender and conflict issues, um, from folks who have been working on women, peace, and security issues for a while. There's a lot of expertise in that field, and not a lot of it is being taken up um, into the literature or into programming in, in, v, in VE work. Um, and this, I think, is, is a real shame because I think that there's a lot of room for cross-fertilization. Um, and so we understand from 
gender and conflict work, that it's gender dynamics and the context um, that might help to shape the frames that are used for recruiting that are making meaning for, for men and women and are maybe driving them to act on particular notions of masculinity or particular notions of femininity. We also know from the gender and conflict field that conflict, of course, has specific impacts on men and women, that they're not, that they're not the same, right? And that women, and especially certain groups of women, migrant women, women who are marginalized economically and socially, that there may be even more vulnerable ability that we need to take into account um, and that conflict also shapes the broader gender dynamics in a context that when you have conflict gender doesn't remain static that we may see opportunities and openings for women's empowerment women's participation um, and conversely we may say see exploitative gender norms and inequalities harden and become more more rigid and powerful and in the v in the case of VE as well too we need to to, to be open to the possibility um, that those kinds of gender dynamics are also playing into that to that context. And then finally, we need to understand that women are not a monolithic block, that we need to also understand how other forms of identity, other forms of vulnerability and marginalization are intersecting um, to, to shape their experience with violent extremism. So, so really in conclusion, um, I've highlighted, I think, some key questions, some key areas for, for further research, um, but I think it's up to, to all of us to consider how to, to take this, this further. Um, I think there's a lot of room for dialogue. I think that there's a lot of room for cross-fertilization between the peace building and CVE fields, and I'm looking forward to our discussion and to, and to hopefully um, collaborating on some of those things with all of you. Great, thanks Leslie. Um, so our other presenter has not popped up. I'm gonna try and, um, hmm. I'm gonna get a five. Where's the other slides? Wait a minute, let's see. They were up, but I don't know where they were, but we can do it. Okay, just a sidebar note on um, Leslie's New York Times photograph on the one and a half week ban on hijab wearing at an Indonesian university where the administration had to back off. I don't know how many of you were able to attend the Resolve event a couple of weeks ago at USIP, but there was a presenter there from Brookings Institution who has run some big data analytics, just rooting around for correlations. And one of the factors he found significantly correlated with the tendency of a country to send fighters to join ISIS happens to be whether local level debates about banning hijab got raised to the national level in the first instance, so became a robust national level debate, and or whether it resulted in a ban on the hijab. So both tended to be important and correlated with sending foreign fighters, national level debate and passing a ban. France was named one of those little, uh, you know, Norway, one of those little Scandinavian countries and Tunisia came into the mix. Don't know what's responsible for it, don't know what it means, but it's an interesting factoid. So I'm gonna do my best to walk through the, the slides um, from Chris Fair since she hasn't appeared. Um, Chris is, is one of the preeminent survey researchers on VE and uh, the research is getting a lot more sophisticated fast. Um, initially, when you look at some of the older Pew surveys, they'd ask sort of general questions about, you know, do you support Sharia on a scale of one to five? Well, Sharia is a very broad set of concepts. People can mean many different things for it. And you're going to get a lot of social desirability bias in answers to such generic questions because if you're a good Muslim, of course you support Sharia. But what is it that you mean by Sharia? It might be very different 
then your next door neighbor means, then the person down the street, then the president of the company, and so on. So she and colleagues have been steadily improving the quantitative research and the kinds of questions that are asked. Now when they ask about Sharia, they will break it down. So they will use a set of some of the harsher penalties. So do you support stoning for adultery? Do you support cutting off the hand of a thief? And they will also ask questions that elicit that when you as a Muslim think about Sharia, do you really mean good governance and justice? And it turns out if you mean good governance and justice, you're much less likely to support a VE organization than if you support that panoply of harsh penalties. All right, so these are insights drawn from both her quantitative and qualitative work. So as she points out, gender's not typically theorized or conceptualized in quantitative efforts. It's almost never included as a specific study variable. At best, it's used as a control. Now, Leslie and I looked at MMA, and we're trying to figure out what this is. Mixed martial arts doesn't make any sense in this context. Um, there is in Pakistan a coalition of far-right, religiously conservative types of political parties, and we suspect it refers to that. So in other words, when we do VE surveys, we're picking one end of the spectrum to focus on and not looking at possibly more moderate groups. But we do know that groups along that spectrum are devoting resources to recruiting and trying to affect and cultivate women. So her bottom line point, which is Leslie's point, if we're not thinking about it as a distinct variable in its own right, then we're making both a conceptual or theoretical and an empirical mistake. All right, so she's got survey data of a very large population from Pakistan in 2012. And she looked at support for different groups, um, the Afghan Taliban, and Lashkari Jangvi and Sapahi Sahaba Pakistan are both anti-Shia groups. They're sectarian groups. Both are Pakistani, both are, um, are, both are based in Pakistan, and both are Deobandi, so on the conservative end of the religious spectrum. So one of the sets of groups, this LEJ SSP, deliberately targets and tries to cultivate women. The Afghan Taliban don't care about women and in fact treat them very badly. So when you look at gender differences in support for this cluster of sectarian organizations and the Afghan Taliban, you find that women are much more likely to support the sectarian organizations than men and much less likely to support the Afghan Taliban. So this presumably has something to do with attempts to cultivate women. It may also be because the Taliban just goes around blowing up neighborhoods, whereas the sectarian groups are targeting Shia mosques, they're targeting Shia processions. So Sunni Muslims are not getting hit in those attacks. I'm not going to go through that. I'm going to spare you this, spare you this, spare you this, and this. All right, moving to Bangladesh. So uh, she's tried to work a lot with Pew's World Muslim data set, um, and in Bangladesh it's close to 2,000 people. It was done, you know, five, six years ago. Um, and take a minute and look at the question. I don't need to read it. You can, you can read it yourselves. And then somebody offer an opinion on that question for me. Yes. Good. Okay. Other responses? What do you think of the question? Yep. Okay. So there could be some, okay, good. Other reactions to the question? All right, it's a very 
murky question that is set up to draw a response in order to defend Islam. Who isn't going to say yes to that? Or why wouldn't you get high positives from that? So she's saying that this is problematic basically for three reasons. As you've noted, it's very emotive. Um, and the whole context is driving the answer that, that you're going to get. And it's conflating support for the cause of defending Islam with the means. So it's a really hard question to answer. And you can't do anything with the results. So this has been a chronic problem in some surveys that we're now beginning to work our way out of in the newest generation of surveys. And as you pointed out, you're going to get upwardly biased responses on that. You're going to get high positives. When if you framed the question, you broke it down and answered it more neutrally, you may get very different responses. And then you're going to get all worked up over that and try and do something with uh, CT strategies with the, the country at hand. Skip these. Um, so um, Chris also did through the Resolve Network a survey um, spring a year ago. And these were um, an embedded series of questions that first asked if you knew of a VEO group, and then asked whether, uh, and then gave you what the objectives were of the group and then asked you whether you supported the objectives and separately whether you supported the use of violence. So she used three groups that were well known. Bangla Bai did a series of bombings simultaneously in Bangladesh circa 2006. He had to be old enough to know about it. But the bombings were so widespread that there's a very strong residual memory there. Um, ABT implemented the Holy Massacre a few years ago, the Bakery Massacre in Dhaka. You may remember that. And then ISIS, of course, is well known. Um, and uh, she doesn't go on to the sequence of questions until sh she ascertains whether you know about the attacks that these three groups carried out or not. All right, if you don't know about it, you don't get the next questions. So here were the goals that were given to the respondents. So one wants Sharia. One is anti-secular. And um, oh, no, sorry, I mixed up the, the attacks. This, this, these were anti-secular attacks. You'll remember the machete murders of publishers and journalists and like. And um, it was Daesh that carried out the Holy Bakery Massacre. So she walked the respondents through this whole series. And you'll see here that there was high knowledge of the Bangla Bai attacks, high knowledge of holy artisans, a little less of um, the uh, anti-secular attacks, because those were largely urban-based, so rural people might not have known. Um, I won't walk through support for the goals or the means, but the bottom line related to gender, since that's the theme, is that there was very little support across the board okay, for both the objectives and the means, particularly low for ISIS which it was the most recent, and that holy bakery attack killed like 23 people. Um, but women supported both the goals and the means, violence, at a higher level than did men. We don't know why. This comes back to Leslie's point that context is everything. You really have to look at this in particular situations. All right, so I, Chris has come to feel when we've talked about research approaches that um, surveys need to be informed by the country context. The questions really have to be geared to the country context. That series of Bangladesh questions we saw, you wouldn't ask in Indonesia. They wouldn't be relevant. Even some of the ones that are relevant, you might frame differently. And the quantitative studies by themselves aren't enough. We do need ethnographic research. We do need qualitative studies and mixed methods. All right, Lashkari Tayaba is, uh, this is the book that's coming out in December. Um, they're a very well-known Pakist Pakistani terrorist organization. The 2008 Mumbai attacks was them, okay? Um, active in Kashmir, 
active blowing up things in India. I think they were responsible for the parliament attack that was 2006 maybe, sometime around, around there. Um, so she's been working for them for a while. They do biographies of their martyrs, basically. Um, she's doing a, a qualitative analysis of these biographies and uh, she's looked at numerous Lashkari Taiba publications for this. Um, I don't know what that means. This may be where they're active or where they're from. Yeah, this is the origin of people who belong to Lashkari Taiba. So you're talking heavy Punjab. So why do they fight? Um, a number of them have former sociopathic tendencies. Um, that kind of contradicts in some ways the findings we've been speaking to now that essentially VE actors are largely normal. But here there may be a bit more sociopathy involved. Certainly one would suspect that with ISIS too, given the egregious forms of violence ISIS perpetrated. Like so many who join, they're, they're seeking meaning, they're bored, they want some adventure, they want something exciting to do, carrying a gun is excited, and they're often disgusted at the decadence of what globalization has done to their communities and society. Um, we do know that friends and family members are incredibly important in pulling men and certainly women into VEO ambits. Um, Chris once worked on U.S. Army recruitment, and that buddy system is really powerful there as well. Many seek personal salvation, and some are really spiritually inclined. There's also a wish to grant extended family me members, mothers, fathers, brothers, and sisters access to heaven, which you can do by becoming a martyr. And then there's a wish to inspire a family to live as better Muslims and be heaven worthy, which they can do by dying for the family. I mean, Chris sometimes refers to this as macabre social capital, and it's, it's not a bad expression. And then, of course, the cause is to defend Muslims from occupiers. This is relevant to Kashmir in particular. Many of those who go off to become martyrs are coming from jihadi families. Um, that's true in, in Indonesia, not specifically about, about the martyrs, but many who join are coming from long-term jihadi networks and, and families. And these families are well known for their contributions over the years. Some limited survey work found that there are practical benefits from having a member of the family who's a martyr. So you might get better matches for your children in marriage. If you've got a, a son, a brother, who mar was martyred in Lashkari Taiba. Improved social standing for the family. This applies to Palestine as well, by the way. Um, and then everyone in the family gets invested in the fighter coming back as a martyr, which is really odd when you think about it rather than a Ghazi, which is a successful conqueror. So somebody who's come back from, from the wars with honors. They'd rather have you as a corpse, in fact. So you get improved social status, better husbands and wives for children, um, and you might get into heaven. You should get into heaven more easily. I mean, one question I have about this is that families in Pakistan tend to be big. So if you've got four sons, is this an easier stance to take than if you have only one son? Maybe if you only have one son, you're a lot more reluctant to see that one son go off and become mar martyred, heaven notwithstanding. A lot of extremist organizations do put a lot of emphasis on uh, family supporting the decision to go off to become a martyr, to go off to fight. Often mothers are directly involved in um, giving their blessing for this. LET puts a lot of emphasis on parents granting permission. And then they focus afterwards on retaining the parents in the network. If they've got no more sons to give up, they might move them to a nonviolent, compatible extremist or militant organization. 
there is a financial incentive here because they are giving the families money. They are visiting. They are making a big deal of them. And they do focus on um, preventing the families from slipping away. They try to keep them in, in the ambit as a network of, of support. So um, her implications are that, as Leslie has said, I, gender is important to policy formulation and analysis. We need to be specifically looking at it, not counting it as a control variable or a side product of other research. Um, gender results in survey studies do need country relevant questions, which are informed by knowledge of how militant organizations are prioritizing women, how they're reaching out. This was another point that, that Leslie said. We do need these other forms of research and not just straight quantitative efforts. And that's it. So now, thank you for your patience with that. Um, we can open the floor to you and we'd very much appreciate your comments, your thoughts, and we'll do our best to handle your questions. Yes, please. Could you say who you are also? Sure. I'm uh, Tom Dunn. I'm uh, Tom Dunn with uh, Convergence. And um, I'm wondering if there's, there's Islam in Islam. And uh, I wonder if the influence of Salafist Islam is what we're referring to here, or uh, does this behavior uh, occur all across the different sects? Salafists are not violent, but there is a set, it seems to me, of convergent gender-related norms that are a cause for concern in potentially leading to regression. Uh, the advances that women have made, um, the advances in gender equality, the ability to um, take part in, in society. Often Salafist groups want to split themselves off from society as well, so that they can live a clean life that is not influenced by, you know, Western globalized influences coming in by degraded culture. That's a problem in a democracy when any group of citizens chooses to split themselves off. It, it has an impact, and many don't participate in political life. They don't, they don't vote, and so on. Do you want to? Yeah, no, I, you, what? Linda saying, I think I think makes a lot of sense. Um, I think it's important to be to be careful, as well too, in in how we might assume Salafist orientations to somehow be simply or linearly correlated with violent extremism. So the example that I gave from Indonesia about the women who wanted permission to wear the full niqab on campus and the backlash against the ban really actually being per perhaps that trigger that tips people from maybe sort of passive approval of some of the goals of VEOs into, into a greater level of participation. I mean, the separation is, is interesting though as well. I mean, in Indonesia, Salafi women oftentimes um, band together and have these vibrant online commerce sites. It's really quite fascinating where they'll be set, where they'll be making and selling goods online to women in that community, but they won't be participating in sort of the market in the public square. So um, there, the, even that, that separation still is oftentimes mediated now by technology or, 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 or by, um, in that case, commerce. So I think it's a little bit tricky, and we don't want to make the assumption that that simply having um, Salafist allegiances is, is going to, in any linear way, push you into to VE. Yeah, I, I certainly don't think it does. I, I do think the confluence around gender norms might um, be reason for um, some degree of concern for women in, in these communities um, when We've done a VE uh, survey in, in recent months in Indonesia, and the results of that suggest um, very high support. I'm not gonna remember exact percentages, but we're talking about 80% who don't think a man and a woman should be alone together um, under any circumstances. Um, very high support for uh, wearing the hijab with no distinction about whose right it is to decide 
to wear it or not. Whereas in Bangladesh, there was very high support for wearing the hijab, but much higher support from women that it was their prerogative to decide. Substantial minorities supporting stoning for adultery, for example, on the order of a third, I, which I really wouldn't have expected for, for Indonesia. Now, some of this comes back to what's the right answer here. If these are scripturalist, uh, then the right answer may be the, the point you made earlier about, you know, there's, there's kind of a correct answer to it. Sorry, go ahead. Here. Hi, Juan from the USIT. I, w I work in a totally different field in, in mediation. Um, but I have a question. I lived in Germany for 20 years, and um, when we have neo-Nazi groups, um, there are programs that help them leave these groups and then reintegrate into society. What, what kind of programs exist to help women leaving these communities and reintegrating, and how successful are they? I don't know of programs that focus on women right now. Do you? No. No. I, I mean, in Indonesia, the program to, to reintegrate you know ISIS returnees has fo has focused on, on, on men um, and not on women. She knows. <laughs> I was going to say that's a very short answer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'm happy to jump into the conversation. Um, my name is Stacy Chamber from the International Civil Society Action Network. Thank you for sharing your research. Um, we've been doing similar research for many years on this topic, so um, happy to engage in the conversation. To answer your question, um, there are women. We partner with 60 women-led organizations globally that are doing a lot of this work on the ground. Uh, since you focused a lot on Asia, I can mention the organization C-SAVE in Indonesia. Sure, the organization C-SAVE in Indonesia um, has been doing some great work on this. Uh, they have partnered with the Ministry of Social Welfare to develop standard operating procedures for the rehabilitation and reintegration um, of women and girls in particular um, from violent extremist groups. And on that note, I'll make a little plug that ICANN has a report coming out in December on this topic of R&R, &R, um, rehabilitation and reintegration of women and girls from violent extremist groups. And if I can ask a question while I have the mic, or do you want to? Yes, please. And then I'd be happy to give it back to you. Um, in, in the case of Germany and elsewhere in Europe, they're reworking some of those models for neo-Nazis and white supremacists. So some of the same organizations are applying those techniques specifically to men now, men, men being the somewhat larger problem. And I think what they find, as with neo-Nazis, is it's, it's hard to let go of the brotherhood. First, there's intimidation and threats that can stop you. But it's kind of a gradual process of out and in, out and in, out and in. And it can take a while, and it can take a lot of support. The problem is scaling these approaches, because they are incredibly labor intensive. So organizations in Germany with some government funding behind them can afford it, but for Indonesia confronting a lot of returnees from the Middle East, and they're particularly heavy on women and children returnees now, the prospect of providing support in isolated places at consistent points in time is a really big challenge, I think. So, do you, at same point or a different point? Because, right, is it the same point or a different point? Well, can, go for it, because I, I don't, I don't want to be overlooking you. All right, go ahead.
Yeah, that's a that's a really interesting question. I mean, I I haven't other than than seeing um, you know o over the past decades really the way in which virulent anti-Semitic propaganda has been taken up by certain um, far right and 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 far right religious groups in Indonesia, but not sort of seeing um, certainly targeting of, of tourists. That's quite that's quite interesting, right? A Indonesia's tourist areas is, is is Bali, and yeah, yeah, I haven't actually seen. Um, operant neo-Nazis. That's really interesting. I'll, I'll keep my eye out next time I'm there. That's really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's really interesting. Yeah. I know that you had your question. I don't want to lose it. Yeah, yeah, please. Um. Let's see, okay, there may be two questions in here. So one, one is you mentioned the challenge of um, attention to women being limited to the local level. And I was curious based on, on that finding, um, and you mentioned the work in Germany too and how intensive it, it is. Um, have you come across any examples of scaling such initiatives and um, you know, having interventions, let's say, at a national level? And then the second question is around um, some of the risk that women face um, by potentially being put in harm's way with the work that, that they're doing. Our partners, with or without us, they're trying to do a lot of this work. Um, and I'm just curious, with a gendered do-no-harm framework, um, if you have any ideas or recommendations around how best to protect them or safeguard against those risks. Yeah, so the distinction between working at the local level and maybe at the national level, because local contexts do matter, there's a lot of focus at, at the local level. There needs to be focus at the local level, but arguably there's too much at the local level that's not embedded in national systems. So then what happens when the project ends? I mean, one thing we know about scaling is the pilots often go nowhere. Small-scale projects never go anywhere. When the money ends, they tend to end. Maybe some legacy of skills and systems are, are left behind. Often this is a product of limited funding. Often it's a product of us doing this work in failing and flailing and failed states. So you've got no government partner. The best you've got are whatever local governance systems have arisen in that place. Now, on um, the new project I'm working on in Indonesia, where the government is committed, is a strong government, is it interested in systems and, and procedures, is tolerance and sort of liberal leaning, we will work both with government entities but also in specific localities on those specific dynamics and try to link the two and have the two learn from each other, in a sense. But often you're left with those, you know, 2,000 youth in, <laughs> in Somalia, because that's what you've got the money for, and you've got no system to embed them in. We also know that pilots and small-scale projects have, tend to have unit costs that are just too high. If you want to scale, if you want to replicate, you've got to look at your unit costs. You have to simplify your model. And then you have to be very active in figuring out Who's going to carry that forward? Which aspects are going to be carried forward? And where's the money going to come from for carrying it forward? That all needs to be thought through. So I don't know. I can't even remember the second question. So. Yeah, yeah. No, just to piggyback on that as well, too. I mean, in the Indonesian context, what's going on right now um, is the development not just of national action plans for gender and VE, but also district level action plans for gender and VE. You know, after a lot of advocacy by the by the National Women's Commission to really get get gender um, sort of taken up by those actors who were trying to think about Indonesia's response to VE. The other side of that, though, is that after the bombings in Surabaya in, in April of this, of this year, um, there was a draft law on terrorism that was, was pushed through, really, in the weeks right after, with absolutely no consultation with women's groups, with actually no consultation um, about, thought about what that might have to do with gender, which sort of effectively, in addition to things like limiting 
defending um, uh, habeas corpus rights and, and bringing the Indonesian military back into um, the center of efforts to, to address the problem, um, pu sort of pushing out or, 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 or you know, in competition with, with the police. And this was sort of a real reversion to pre-dictatorship military prominence that human rights activists had been critiquing quite stridently, but the shock at especially women's participation in this really kind of drove like broad political support for, you know, we need this draconian law and we need it now because even, even women and children, um, you know, people were just so appalled by the idea of a, you know, a nine-year-old carrying a bomb. Um, so I think that there's like pl plus and minuses there, so some successes, but then also um, how do you then also mobilize gender advocates to, to sort of step in um, when legislators and, and others like kind of take these, these, um, these, these moves without paying attention to any of the consultations that were being done. And then on the question of do, of, of, of do no harm, right? Um, you know, I think that we're oftentimes limited and this is kind of something that happens across the board um, in our monitoring and evaluation to looking at um, sort of performance metrics, right? You know, what is this, this, this project actually accomplishing in terms of, of meeting its stated goals and so on, but really kind of thinking out Side of the box, um, and also maybe thinking over a longer term. What are the what what are the implications for the women who are participating? What are the implications for broader narratives and systems of, of gender and gender inequality? Um, and then also being able to monitor not just risks to that particular woman who's participating in that mother school, right? But also, you know, is there like a broader community level backlash? against this, for instance, you know, what is this actually doing um, that we might want to, to, to be aware of? So, so to me, I think it really is a, is, is a shift in, in how we're thinking about monitoring and evaluating programs, which unfortunately doesn't often happen because we're so interested simply in, in, in you know, proving to, to whatever donors that, that we've met uh, the objectives in our log frame. So, you know, there, and there's a lot of, of course, really good, I mean, the conflict resolution and peace building fields have really pioneered some, some um, some, some really innovative do no harm approaches. So again, this is another space where I think borrowing from peace building and conflict resolution can really help people who are working on DE. There are certainly approaches that try to deal with grievances. So if there's a set of grievances about being unable to provide for the family, uh, that, that important loss of a sense of what it means to be male. Um, in, in many Middle Eastern countries, being able to marry when you come of age because you can't get the job that will support a family or you can't rent the apartment because you don't, you don't have the cash. So the focus on, on employment and so on and on skills training can address some of those grievances, though unemployment in survey after survey has never been tied to, to VE. Um, at the systematic end of it, you'd, you'd be working with ministries of labor and the like, and these would look maybe more like standard private sector programs that try and get the business climate right so that there's an investment 
try and get the vocational training system right so that there's, there's appropriate training that is market-based that, that goes on? I don't know if you have better answers to that. Yeah, yeah. No, and just to your first point, I mean, thank you. That's very, that's, that's well taken. Um, hopefully all of us are aware that not only um, Islamic groups are, are, are VE groups, right? You know, when you're looking at Asia, we also have to think about Burma. We can think about India. We Sri can think we can think about Sri Lanka. Um, there's many, many other examples. I think this this was just um, an artifact of my focus on Indonesia, and then also Kyrgyzstan, and then and then Chris Fair's focus on on, on Pakistan. But um, absolutely well taken. As to your second point, um, there is increased attention both in programming and then also analytically as well, to thinking about masculinity, to thinking about violent masculinity, um, hyper-masculinity, and then to be programming, um, doing programming in positive masculinity is oftentimes the framing. I know that in Indonesia, in the, in the program that's starting up there, um, there's been a demand to start fathers' schools along with, with mothers' schools to try to get fathers involved and also thinking about how parents can be part of the, the solution um, to VE. So there are increasingly attempts to a, a, attend to that, but then how you then scale that up from the individual level to a, to a broader social level is I also think part of the challenge. Oftentimes there's an assumption that somebody will be trained in these positive norms and then they'll just go out and spread them. Um, but I think as we all know, indiv indi individuals are, are embedded within cultural contexts, they're embedded within narrative contexts. And so I actually think that there needs to be more effort to think about how we then also change our narrative landscapes, whether that's through media creation or, or how however we might approach that social media certainly um, and that yeah yeah so yes I, th I think just I, the effort to push back on on distorted or hyper aggrandized notions of masculinity seems to me to be tiny in these countries there's only one organization I've been able to find yeah. in Indonesia and I when I was in in touch with them to see what what they could do to help they said, oh, we only work in the world of domestic violence. That, that's our concern. Um, and they're, they're truly tiny. So trying to build up the resources for this in the countries in which we do development assistance is, is a major concern. I don't even know if Bangladesh or Pakistan have such organizations. Do you have a related point? Or are we moving on to the? Please. So hi, my name is Adriana Davis. I'm with USAID. And um, just in answer to your question about intervention models directly addressing the sort of agree your women's rights are taking away from my male right to masculinity. There was an example of, or is, of a successful approach through the PEPFAR HIV um, programs addressing sexual and gender-based violence. And that was in Uganda, and it was um, called the SASA model. That's not an acronym, that's like a local language word, um, Swahili or something, so it's S-A-S-A -S -A exclamation point. And I believe they did RCTs on it, and they also, what's cool about it is they actually showed that they could do real change in a, quite a short time. And what it looked at was more looking at concepts of power, you know, because it's been the zero-sum concept of power. Like, if you start talking about women's rights, or if you start getting more rights, you're taking away my rights. So I don't want to hear about children's rights or women's rights because that takes away my rights. And what this, um, I guess, approach did was start talking about, in, with the community, at the community level, more pluralistic concepts of rights and how there's different types of power. And uh, No, sorry, not rights. They started looking at, um, it was in relation to rights and GBV, but they looked at pl more plurist pluralistic concepts of power. That, you, in other words, there's lots of different types of power. There's referent power. There's this kind of power. That everything is not, you know, it, power is not zero sum, and there's different types. And that seemed to be quite effective quickly. And they actually started these communities they were working with started like um, not only talking about it and changing norms, but actually coming up with like their own municipal rules and laws about like you know sort of talking about. Um, about how to address this if something came up. So was, I would check that out, SASA with an exclamation point. Um, I think that's a real area of potential that we haven't really looked at in some of these other issues. But anyway, back to my question. I wanted to, and it's change the topic sort of in that, specifically on the um, findings on um, women's economic empowerment, 
um, which obviously always a, a goal for 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 us um, in you know in the development community and those of us that focus on women, peace, and security and gender issues. But um, my I don't I don't want to say my concerns in terms of how I can see that translating. Um, my concern is that how do we prevent that from being oh well our solution to everything and all women, peace, and security and um, or, or women in CV is just to do a bunch of IGAs for women, and that is going to solve the VE problem, and that is going to be equal women, peace, and security, or women's CV, because I've seen that happen, and there's a real, you know, people don't know, and then you start losing the points of looking at the gender dynamics and the more complex stuff, or the pillars of women, peace, and security. And then the second part of that is also around do no harm. How do we, in so many of these contexts where Part of the issue is people are so excluded and disenfranchised because you have the elites have all the power and money, wealth buys voice. And if you don't have money, then you don't have a say, whether it's at the community level or and you don't have standing. So how do we make sure that while we are advancing women's economic empowerment, we're not unintentionally reinforcing this message that in order to have a voice or deserve status or standing or participate, you have to have money. You know, I mean, you have to have wealth because I, I, we have to think really hard about not reinforcing those messages where so often that is the case. You only have power, even at local level up, if you have money. And you don't feel comfortable speaking out and participating if you don't have money. Right. So I think that, you know what I'm saying? I think we do need better analytic frameworks for trying to understand some of this. For me, a strong analytic framework would try to get at exactly what you're talking about, which is how do people themselves define empowerment? What kind of empowerment is important or viable for them in a particular context? I think, you know, it's a big, huge, really interesting tangent to think about how oftentimes we reduce empowerment to the economic, right? Um, or assume that that's somehow going to be primary, but it may also, um, as people conceptualize it themselves, may involve lots and lots of other kinds of things, right? Um, I don't think I'm arguing, and I don't think that any of us should be arguing that economic empowerment is going to be a magic bullet for either you know, conflict prevention or, or CVE work. Um, I think that it's part of the package, and I personally am not willing to give up thinking about the so-called push factors just because they sometimes seem um, vague and you know where where's the the sort of linear logic that if you press this button you're going to get this kind of output so but it's still important because we know of course that that women are being targeted and that part of the message is that you can find empowerment you know however it's defined by participation in, in a VEO. The flip side of this, of course, is that in some of these cases, like the one I mentioned briefly of Indonesian women migrants in Hong Kong, having economic empowerment actually makes you more vulnerable, right? Because then you're being hit up for this so-called money jihad, right, to make either financial contributions or to you know, use your, your free time off. Because I forgot to mention that the reason why it's Hong Kong is that a, a certain amount of labor protections um, in comparison to, say, the experience of women migrants in Gulf Gulf countries gives them maybe a day off every once in a while so they can get together and they're online and so they become um, easier targets, right? So, so certainly there's not like a one-to-one -one correspondence, but I go back to saying we need stronger models, we need stronger frameworks for trying to do gender and VE assessment. Right now we don't have a strong framework for thinking about what, what we're analyzing and what we're assessing. We're borrowing maybe assessment frameworks from, you know, USAID's gender assessment or from a, a conflict assessment, but we're you're know, trying to really think about what is it that we're supposed to be looking at. Um, and so I'm interested as well in, in how we can use the existing data and existing questions to try to do a better job. Like, what's empowerment? I was just thinking you were adding at all. Like, how are we going to do it? Yeah, yeah. Because no one, I mean, we've been doing this for a long time. Yeah. Sure. 
Sure. Yeah, yeah. No, and this is what happens. Like, we know how to do this, whereas, like, what mo how many models do we have for actually successfully working on violent or, you know, slash toxic masculinity and how to work on that effectively, right? And so, I, yeah, exactly. So I think analysis, like, helps us to avoid those one-size-fits-all solutions just because, yeah, we know how to do this, so let's throw some economic empowerment in there. Yeah. I mean, I, th I think there is always relabeling once you figure out where the money is. So a lot of things will pass as CVE that aren't effective CVE tools. On uh, the money speaking, I was part of a large study of women's self-help groups in India. Mind you, it's old, it's like 15 years old, but we looked at 260 groups in four states, and the money mattered. You, you didn't have the same say, you didn't necessarily get the same kinds of loans if you weren't powerful in that village context. And often groups were, were separated by, by caste and, and the like. Um, so it was a problem to figure out how to deal with it. In terms of women's economic empowerment in, in this space, I think there are a, a number of issues to look at. Maybe it gives them more say in the household, but then if, if you look at the case of Lashkari Tayaba, what, what are they using that say for? It could be to encourage men to go um, fight. And I think you also have to worry about unintended consequences. If you haven't done anything for the men and you've just given the women an ability to earn an income, then do the men feel even more demasculized, demasculinized, whatever the word is. Yeah. Yeah. Other, other questions? How much of your time am I taking? It is, is three. We could entertain a, a last question. I could let you go. Anyone else want to? You want to run out and get coffee and cookies? Anything else? Thank you very much. And thank you all for your, your patience. Patience. Your yeah. It was a pleasure to have you.